Story continued from Soro Faganak's episode. It has been a full day since the Ceratosaurus pack had its close call at the Diplodocus carcass, and they have retreated deeper into their territory. The lead female took a big risk scavenging from the neighboring Allosaurus, but it's not every day that a fresh sauropod carcass ends up at the edge of your territory, and the pack had fed well the first time. Now back in more familiar territory, they were safe from the larger Allosaurus. However, the appearance of a Sorophaganax now worried the scarred female. The presence of a new apex predator in her hunting grounds could make things difficult, as they already had one living amongst them. Her thoughts were interrupted when one of the two males smelled something in the undergrowth. As the pack followed him, they soon picked up the scent of dead flesh. The body was downwind of them, but with their incredible sense of smell, they soon located the source, a dead stegosaur. Whatever had killed it seemed to have done an incredibly effective job. The head was completely removed with little sign of struggle, and no blood on the stegosaur's stagomizers. In fact, there was no trace of blood from the predator at all. Whatever did this was able to catch the herbivore completely by surprise, bite into its neck, and then behead it in one clean bite, and then proceed to eat not just the flesh, but also the bones as well. The male ceratosaurus who found the carcass first scanned the surroundings, but there didn't appear to be anything nearby. The forest was unusually silent, though. Still, three of the four pack members approached the carcass, but the scarred female held back. Over the scent of the decaying meat, she picked up another scent. Behind the carcass and on top of the hill, and just out of their line of sight, the predator that took down the stegosaur was lying down asleep until it heard its kill being disturbed. The only warning was a sharp exhale of air before the massive creature reared up on its hind legs and revealed itself to the shocked female Ceratosaurus below. Torvosaurus. Nine meters long and twice the height of the Ceratosaurus, the bulky carnivore's jaws were still covered in the dried blood of the stegosaur. It eyed the three smaller predators feeding on its kill and without hesitation, charged. Though it didn't make a sound, its loud footsteps alerted the three unaware pack members, who were suddenly faced with a full-grown Torvosaurus charging down the hill straight for them. The whole pack scattered. The towering predator lunged after them. He ran after the smaller female, chasing her around a tree. The female ducked under a low-lying branch. The Torvosaurus ran through it, reducing the wood to splinters. The smaller hunter was more agile and jinxed out of the Torvosaurus's path so he chose a new target. One of the males had tried to climb the rocky slope, but this was not something his body was designed for, and despite his desperation, couldn't get high enough to escape the larger predator's grasp. The Torvosaurus bit the end of the Ceratosaurus's tail and pulled backwards. The male Ceratosaurus tried to grip with his claws, but he was pulled down the rocks, his lower jaw slamming against the hard surface every time he was lurched backwards. The Torvosaurus pulled the smaller theropod to the ground, when he himself was bitten. The scarred-faced Ceratosaurus clamped her jaws around the larger predator's left shin, growling in anger. Despite the clean bite, her teeth didn't cut through the Torvosaurus's thick muscles. It was like biting into the bark of a redwood. The Torvosaurus let go of the male Ceratosaurus and stepped his left leg back, lifting the Ceratosaurus like she was nothing. Realizing this was not a battle she could have a hope of winning, the female let go and darted under the Torvosaurus's tail as the multi-ton predator snapped his jaws at her. But like her smaller counterpart, the scarred female was more agile than the heavy Torvosaurus. And as she made her escape, the larger hunter looked around, hearing the sounds of four retreating pairs of feet. Exhaling in annoyance, the Torvosaurus examined his left leg and saw he only had minor cuts. He then walked back to his resting spot and lay down, Within a minute, he was back to sleep, chasing off smaller carnivores, not being something he would lose sleep over. The pack of Ceratosaurus regrouped deeper into the forest, the only injury being the lead male's tail, but he was fortunate to still have the end of his tail. Allosaurus, Sorophaganax, and a Torvosaurus in the space of a day, the Ceratosaurus kingdom suddenly felt a lot more crowded than the scarred female was used to. 
Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the final member of the Morrison Predator quadrilogy, Torvosaurus. Torvosaurus's first remains were originally discovered in 1899 in Wyoming. However, these first remains that were parts of the hands were kept in storage till 2010 and described in 2014. The species was first named in 1979, and since then, fossils have been assigned to it from Colorado, Portugal, Germany, and possibly, remains have been found in England, Spain, Tanzania, and Uruguay. There were two species, Tanneri, mostly found in North America, and Gurieni, mostly known from Europe. There is also a third unnamed species found in Germany. Although most finds are fragmentary, there was a 55% complete skeleton found in 2012 in Colorado named Elvis that helped to give a more complete picture of this species. It lived in the late Jurassic between 165 and 148 million years ago, and if the many remains from around the world are indeed all from Torvosaurus, it was a very widespread genus. Tanneri grew up to 9 meters long, stood 3 meters tall, and weighed between 2 and 2.2 tons. Gurenyi grew between 10 and 11 meters and weighed up to 4 tons, meaning both species are close to the largest theropods of the Jurassic period. Other than size, the main difference between them is the amount of teeth in the jaws, with Tanneri having more, and the shape of their skulls. Torvosaurus belonged to the Megalosauridae family, and as a result is stocky and robust, with a wide pelvis carrying around extra weight, but this did mean that it was not a fast runner. It was more likely an ambush predator, using its bulk to overpower its prey, and not built for long chases. It had an elongated, narrow snout, with a kink in its profile just above the nostrils. The jaws were lined with large, curved teeth, backed up by a powerful bite force of over 10,000 pounds per square inch. The arms were short, but were thought to be quite strong, and may have been used to secure prey. It had three long fingers, each tip with a claw. The first, aka the thumb, was the largest, getting up to 20 centimeters long. One of the most interesting finds attributed to Torvosaurus was made in 2013 in Portugal, where a clutch of fossilized eggs and embryos were found. This is very important for a number of reasons. One, these are the most primitive dinosaur embryos known. Two, these are the only basal theropod embryos known. Three, fossilized eggs and embryos are rarely found together. Four, it represents the first evidence of a one-layered eggshell for theropod dinosaurs. It also helps shine light on theropod nurturing, as the eggshells are highly porous, allowing efficient gaseous exchange between the external and internal media, indicating the eggs were buried for incubation, similar to modern sea turtles. A fascinating find, not only for Torvosaurus, but also Jurassic theropods in general. Most Torvosaurus remains come from the Morrison Formation, a very well-researched formation and time period, where it would have shared its environment with multiple other large predators, including Ceratosaurus, Allosaurus, and Saurophaganax. So how did all these large carnivores exist together? The first answer would be that they lived in different areas. Torvosaurus and Ceratosaurus are known to have lived in more forested areas, as well as near coastal areas or rivers, while Allosaurus preferred more open areas. This seems to work as Allosaurus is more lightly built with longer legs meant to run down prey, while Torvosaurus is more bulky and would use the condensed forests to conceal itself. Another is niche partitioning, with each species going after different prey and therefore not directly competing with each other. It should also be noted that Allosaurus was by far the most common of the four species, making up to 70% of veripod specimens. Another clue is in the skulls and teeth of each species. Allosaurus had small, sharp teeth with a weak bite force, and may not have been able to tackle tougher parts of a carcass, while Ceratosaurus, with its large teeth and shorter, stronger jaws, may have been able to access deeper parts of a carcass, as well as some bones. Finally, Torvosaurus, being the largest and strongest, might have been the one capable of tearing large carcasses apart, or even dismembering sauropod limbs, cracking open bones to access the marrow. Of course, with its larger size, 
Torvosaurus could bully other carnivals off their kills, and scavenge whenever the opportunity arrived. Now, for a long time there has been the idea that these larger theropods were so large that they couldn't hunt other animals, and relied exclusively on scavenging. This is an idea I simply refuse to take seriously. No modern apex carnival does this, and nearly all carnivores scavenge when the opportunity presents itself. The idea that an animal was too large to hunt down its own prey is also baffling, as there were plenty of large, slow-moving herbivores like stegosaurs in the Morrison that would have been within the ability of Torvosaurus to hunt. And as I said in the Saurophaganax episode, I believe that the abundance of sauropod species in the Morrison is the reason why we see such large predators in the first place. Even if they couldn't tackle the largest adults, that doesn't mean they couldn't go for the young, sick, or injured. But with that rant over, Torvosaurus, everybody! A species that was not only the largest megalosaur, but may also be one of the last. But what do you think of Torvosaurus? What lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.